Hello everyone, I'm Jean-Claude Abion Mystic and welcome to this very special Precious Metals Report here, a weekend review with Mr. Andy Sheckman. You can find his work at milesfranklin.com. Let's give him a big warm welcome. Precious metals. Good to see you, JC. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me here. It's always great. I look forward to these weekly conversations very, very much. Well, I'm happy to have you here today. Of course, a lot of things in the news uh, this morning. Uh, it's a shake, rattle, and roll time, obviously. So I'm happy that you're here exactly on this day to talk about all of these amazing topics. Thank you, someone. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here on this live interactive show. I will be bringing up your comments and your questions as we go along. But first, I want to start the story with this. Now, Cliff Hyde posted this this morning on his Twitter, and this is from uh, supposedly an insider here who works at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and uh, this person was saying that they had just received the numbers for the uh, consumer price index here for the month of June and that those numbers were going to be in the double digits. So the hyperinflation uh, that John Williams was warning about in our last interview with Andy Sheckman appears to be rearing its ugly head. Let's start here, Andy. What do you make of this? Of course, this is not official right now. This is behind the scenes information. But what do you make of this? Where are we going? Well, you know, I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I live in Florida now, and but I still read the Minneapolis Star Tribune and the other day I was reading it to stay in touch with what's going on back home and uh, General Mills is raising the price of their their uh, end product like their boxes of cereal by 7% citing increased costs uh, and we are seeing really strong numbers across the board in, in just about anything in terms of consumer goods. Uh, you take a look at the last month CPI numbers, which, you know, you and I both know are really not so accurate, but at 5% nonetheless. And, you know, um, I find it interesting that the bond market has basically come out on their own and said, well, hey, you know what? There's no inflation here, nothing to look at. Keep on walking. The reason I say that and the reason that the bond market is typically given more credit than just about anything. It's the bond market that is the bigger bigger of all the markets, and it is one that is thought to um, cumulatively maybe uh, show us the way that the markets are moving ahead of times. So in other words, when we see the bond market, uh, when interest rates fall, and so in other words, we had a 10-year Treasury benchmark just a month ago or two months ago at uh, – 175 basis points. Now we're at around 140. That's a 35 basis point drop. That's a significant drop. But what that says is that the bond market says inflation maybe really is transitory, right? Mm -hmm. it's, crap. it's total crap because, uh, in other words, what I think is happening here, JC, is that the Fed is buying the back end of the bond market. They're trying to blur these inflationary numbers. They call it transitory. What the hell is transitory anyway? Uh, and then they come out uh, and I believe buy the back end of the bond market. And the reason I think it's the Fed buying the back end of the bond market to lower those interest rates, to quell the talk of inflation, to make the dollar seem stronger than it is, to keep the game going. The reason I think it's them is because just ask yourself this plain and simple question. Who in their right mind would buy a 10-year treasury earning uh, 140 basis points when by their own measurements, which we know are BS, they say inflation's at 5%. Now, you're talking a guaranteed 360 basis point loss year over year compounding for 10 years. That isn't the way to get ahead. In fact, people give, uh, you know, they, they say, well, why would you buy gold and silver? For well, the reason it doesn't pay in, obviously, uh, is less concentrated okay, negative uh, basis point uh, rate of return. So when you talk about what the insider is saying with these CPI numbers, uh, I would say to you, uh, I believe it, that, that uh, very much uh, is jibes with what John Williams is saying, but it's not what the Fed wants to put out as popular narrative. And this is why I don't believe uh, the bond market, when it's telling us, well, interest rates are falling, so inflation expectations really aren't the problem. In other words, they're saying that it really is transitory and it will 
uh, normalize here? And uh, I don't think so, frankly. Uh, I would submit that these numbers are being massaged and manipulated to fit the same rhetoric that the Fed is trying to tell us and that everything is okay here. And quite frankly, I don't think it is. Um, and so when I see those numbers, I believe them. John Williams is, is really a legend in this industry. John Williams uh, does not do anything other than, I don't knock it off. John Williams doesn't do anything. My dogs heard your dogs and now they're barking. <laughs> John Williams doesn't do anything inside site numbers the way that they used to be quoted uh, under previous administrations before they were changed and massaged to meet this agenda. But I'm telling you, just ask yourself this question. Who would buy a 10-year treasury guaranteed to lose over 3% compounding per year for 10 years? No one. And that's why it's the Fed, in my opinion, buying the back end of the bond market to quell, to quiet this inflationary conversation. But quite frankly, I believe it to my soul. I believe that inflation is rising and the Fed has to continue to print money. And if they don't, then the whole thing just collapses under its own collective weight. So, yeah, I'm, I'm more in the inflationary camp. I know a lot of people out there are in the deflationary camp. And this is a, a battle. Which is it? Inflation or deflation? And I would simply submit this. that Yes, there are global deflationary forces pouring down upon on the world with all of the debt that we see, it's, it's smothering, but the Fed realizes that they have to act in an inflationary manner in order to keep the whole thing from, from popping. When you have so much debt, the inability to service the ever increasing mountain of debt becomes a problem. But here's the self-reinforcing loop. Problem is that by keeping interest rates low, it only encourages more debt. And we're going deeper and deeper and deeper into debt, whether it be government or personal. Someday, those rates have to rise. And the fact of the matter is, whether they choose to continue to monetize the bond, like what I'm suggesting they're doing here, buying the back end of the bond market, to hold interest rates low, to say there is no inflation, to make the dollar seem strong, to create the wealth effect, make everyone feel wealthy in their 401k and their real estate, uh, if they continue to do that, that becomes a hyperinflationary problem, which means interest rates ultimately rise. Or if they back away in total from the bond market and say, we're going to let Mother Nature take care of this once and for all, and then interest rates go to the moon. And you you have a realization at this point that both roads ultimately lead to, lead to the same place. But in the way that most politicians uh, transact policy and and and, uh, and business, it's let's kick the can as far down the road as we possibly can. And I think that's why you're seeing interest rates fall. It's not because people believe everything is great. It's because I think the Fed doesn't want to let people see exactly what's happening and freak out and run for the exit. And, and I think really that's a more accurate depiction in my mind of what we're seeing than a CPI number at 5%, which isn't true. It should be a whole lot higher, closer to what this insider is saying and what John is saying. And what does that mean? What do the ramifications mean when you have double digit uh, inflation with interest rates at near the lowest level in the history of this country? It's a problem, a big problem, especially when you need foreign interest to buy our bonds. And I would argue they're starting to stop or stopping to buy our bonds and now you see the Fed picking up where they left off to keep the game going. Right, absolutely. Uh, Cliff, thank you so much. He says, uh, yeah, we can benefit here if we can increase the like ratio on our channel. Maybe <laughs> we could save some of the problems we're having here. On that note too, we're just now having problems uh, on Patreon. So <laughs> folks, bear with me here. We're trying to rejig everything here, of course, but uh, Janine and I were just, um, I guess accused is the right word of inciting uh, violence here. That was the latest accusation on Patreon. We're dealing with that now, uh, but it's basically removed quite a bit of content uh, that people were paying for. So um, I'm working with this, JC, JC, nothing frightens me more than this. I mean, I, I, I'm being honest out here to all the people listening. JC is one of the best guys I've met in 30 years in this industry. And I haven't had the pleasure of getting to meet him in person like I had planned to because we go to, I go to Montreal for Brinks audits where we have a Brinks program in Montreal uh, three times per year. And since, uh, since the uh, cough uh, problem, no one's been able to, uh, 
to get across the border and looking to have dinner with, with JC at uh, Q de Cheval. But uh, looking the, point of it is, the point of it is, is that it's very frightening to me. You know, you got, you have people out there telling the truth in a, in a polite and articulate and responsible manner and accused of this nonsense. Uh, I, I think it's, it's appalling. It's frightening. And I personally, this is why uh, Chris Marcus and I uh, decided to send you some silver, uh, just in a way to help monetize what you're doing, the lack of real information, like the, the the information that comes out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you should take the L out of there and just have BS. Right. We're not getting information, but from people like you and Cliff and Bix and Chris, the people who are giving us real information are being bastardized and it's just not fair and it's not right. And you are not inciting violence. You're doing anything but you're inciting truth. In a, in, a, in, a, in a responsible manner. And I, it bothers me. And in fact, since 2020, it's been one of my biggest fears that, you know, this isn't the country that I remember where freedom of speech is not only accepted, but it's, it's endorsed, that have a discussion without the divisiveness. And everywhere we look, we see this divisiveness. And it's this feeling, this feeling that I have permeating you know, I ask myself, what kind of country boasts of a uh, of a all time high stock market yet has this type of divisiveness within its own fabric, where hundreds of people are gunned down over the July Fourth weekend, where where a city that I was so proud to live in in Minneapolis, I had to literally pick up and leave like that because I couldn't take it anymore. Mm-hmm. The point of it is, is that things are not right in this country, and and I would assume you would echo something similar in Canada. But the point of it is, is that uh, I think sometimes you need to trust your gut. You, you need to understand that all of these things that we're talking about, whether it be the, the misinformation from, from the Fed or the Bureau of Labor Statistics, whether it be the censorship that we're seeing, whether it be, you know, uh, massive inflation, whatever it is, whatever is concerning you, um, you know, I think you need to trust your gut because we're not getting the scoop. And yet from people like you who do it in a responsible way are being kicked off of the platforms. I find it really, really, really very frightening. And my heart goes out to you. And if, if Miles Franklin can do anything, and me personally, to help your channel, uh, help people like Cliff, help people like Bix, help people like Chris, uh, I would do anything I could. And I'm honored to be, to, to be uh, associated with someone of your character and, you're the furthest thing from someone who incites violence, in my opinion. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, I, I, I might take you up on that, too, because Bix and I were talking yesterday, too, and he just got a strike also uh, for something um, through Patreon that he had posted way, way, way back when. So they're uh, they're tightening down uh, the, bat, the, the hatches here. I think they know that this panic is overwhelming them, as Cliff I was saying in his reports here maybe a month or two ago. So uh, they're taking all of these last desperate moves. And this was part of that episode, actually, uh, with Janine. We were talking about the fact that um, the dark side call which you will hear uh is really in panic mode and they're they're throwing all the hail marys they can here to try to get out of trouble including maybe going way too far on this uh censorship here it's absolutely crazy but i want to let the audience know here um i made a promise to all you patreon members to provide you with that content and i'm going to fulfill that promise whether it's on patreon i'm working with them now to try to resolve that or someplace else, just <laughs> bear with me here a couple of days until we resolve that, but I will fulfill all of those orders, absolutely uh, mark my words. Okay, you mentioned something earlier, uh, and thank you everyone for uh, for bearing with us through that conversation. It needs to be had, and you guys understand the issues that we're going through here and trying to provide all of this content for you guys. Now, you mentioned earlier, Andy, that the banks were using backdoor mechanisms here to kind of hide some of the issues. This last thing I was posted on uh, July 5th, I believe it was, uh, Zoltan here was um, expecting to see maybe two trillion in a couple of weeks here um, hitting uh, the reverse repo market. How does that tie into what you were just talking about now, uh, the backdoor shenanigans here to try to prevent this information from actually hitting mainstream news here about what the reality is of our Exactly to the to what you and I were talking about off air, and I think you're probably going to show it here in a second with Wells Fargo. The banks do not want to lend money. I'll use my own personal experience for a moment. I, I when I bought this house in Florida, um, I bought the house and purposely took out a big mortgage. 
And I did it because I was able to secure a 3% mortgage. And if money creation and inflation is running at five, or as, as John Williams would say, 10, then why not take out a mortgage at three? It's free money, right? Yeah. I literally got to the point, and I own a company that's been in business for 31 years. And, and I've done fairly well over the last decade, and I have a good credit score, and they didn't want to lend me the money. It took 12 weeks to get the loan. I almost, I mean, I literally almost lost it three or four times with the mortgage broker, and he kept saying, don't shoot the messenger. And I'm saying, this is absolutely stupid, the stuff that you're asking me for. They wanted three years worth of every single check my business wrote out. Now you're talking zip files, you're talking thousands of checks and they wanted every single one. They, they went through everything I did. They wanted to know what the credit card receipt from Best Buy was for. I said, I bought a TV for the new house. What the hell are you talking about? Well, can you show us the receipt? I mean, this is the kind of stuff that the bank, now I had bought three or four houses prior to this since my mid twenties uh, that I've lived in. Now I'll be 51 this summer and I've never had anything like this. They want to see your W-2s, you show them that and boom, you get your, your home. Well, this is vastly different. Now, this is kind of what Zoltan is saying, and this is what what Wells Fargo is saying. I'm well, you got Wells Fargo saying we're closing our line of credit, and you got Zoltan saying that the reverse repo market's going to the moon. They're all the same thing. What that basically means is the banks would rather park their money at five basis points at the Fed. Now, you're talking five basis points. That's nothing. All right, that's 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 uh, five cents per dollar. That's nothing. Uh, and so, uh, actually, I take that back. That yeah, no, that's right. That is that right? No, it'd be five cents per ten dollars, right? So, whatever. It's it's hundred basis points is one percent. One percent. So you're yeah. So it's nothing. But they would rather park it there with the Fed overnight. Uh, earning five basis points with safety, then lend it out into this economy, which is being eviscerated in so many levels. And you can see that it's the same thing. If Wells Fargo says, look, we're a bank that makes money by lending and we're going to close our, our, our line of credit. That's huge. That's the same thing as all of the banks saying, we don't want to lend out into the public at three or four or 5%. Instead, we'll take five basis points and keep it safe with the Fed. Mm -hmm. Does that, I mean, you can see, that it's very disingenuine. The numbers that we are getting, the info. So maybe they're saying we don't want to make out a loan and get paid back in inflated dollars. I don't know what it is that they're saying, but the bottom line is it's 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 symptomatic of of, of big money not wanting to let go of it, of feeling that there's too much fear out there, too much concern out there uh, in the make believe economy. Um, then would justify lending it out even to people with good credit. Instead, they'd rather give it to the Fed and earning next to nothing with safety. This is a big problem. And uh, this is why uh, I think people need to really trust their gut. Because on one hand, you have the talking uh, heads saying, talking mouthpieces saying, hey, everything's great. Look, the bond market it's telling you inflation is going away, the economy is strengthening, everything is great, it's transitory, and yet you have one of the biggest banks in the world closing their line of credit, and you have massive demand in the reverse repo market, which which basically says there's more cash out there than they want to lend into the system. Instead, they'll give it to the Fed, and yet uh, everything is supposedly rosy. No, I think it's a big problem. These Those two pieces are very much related but also very frightening as it portrays for what's coming down the pike. It's almost like they see what's coming and trying to rein things in before the shit hits the fan, if I can say that. That makes sense. And also, like, okay, here's the irony of this a news article. Too. <laughs> Banks customers will be penalized for closing their lines of credit, even though they didn't ask to close their lines. Oh, my yeah, God. God. Like, <laughs> this is the cherry on top. It's a big F you. To yes. the it's like, it's going to penalize their credit score is what yeah. it means. Yeah. And, and which, again, is just this is what I mean about it's about the feeling inside your gut that something doesn't feel right. And even if you can't articulate it, you're seeing these stories pop up everywhere, all sorts of of of, of disconcerting pieces of information. And um, this is certainly one of them. And, yeah, it's it is uh, it doesn't bode well, I think, for for a recovery or for for things getting better anytime soon if you see banks cutting off their their lines of credit which is a primary source of revenue for the banks and 
and choosing to park it at the Fed earning next to nothing than lending it out, which is the primary source of their revenue. Something is amiss. And I'll tell you, much like all of the talk that I've talked about for the last four years about the, the big banks accumulating precious metal through the reclassification of gold as a tier one, Basel three back in 19, 2019, the same thing is true. If you look at what's happening now, the banks started accumulating gold uh, in 2017, in 2018, they reclassified gold in 2019, they continue to, uh, to, to buy gold and you see massive deliveries off of Colmex. It's all the same thing. It's front running what's coming next. The insiders know what's coming and they are preparing, they're reining in, they're accumulating, they're de-dollarizing, they're removing counterparty risk and they're doing it overtly yet we don't get information except from troublemakers like you who incite violence. And then they pull you off of, of, of a platform when all you're trying to do is help people prepare for what's coming the way the insiders are doing in an articulate, professional, nice manner. It makes me nauseous. But I'll tell you, when you look at it all, put it all together, all of the movements by the biggest money in the world is to de-dollarize, remove counterparty risk, take possession, accumulate precious metals, and 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 not lend money out into the system, which is supposedly on the rebound. These are these are ominous ominous events, Jason. Well, listen. A couple of years ago, we saw the events happening in Europe, in Greece, in particular. Uh, people were frozen out of their bank accounts. You and I talked about last week. I don't remember which bank it was. Somewhere in, uh, I think it was Lebanon. Of course, that were preventing their. Um, uh, their customers to take money out of the bank. So there's this big riot happening here. And here, as I was talking about this a couple of years ago with my friends and family, we were like, ah, oh, JC, that would never happen. Well, here we are, we have Wells Fargo. This is okay. <laughs> you know, one of the biggest banks around the planet who are closing your lines of credit without, you know, permission or telling you. So what's the next step? Are they also going to incite or, um, I would say implement their bail-in legislation. This has been on the books for a number of years. A lot of people say, well, they would never use it. I'm like, well, why did they put it on the books? So Not only that, don't forget, the same time they did bail-in legislation, it's really important people hear me right now. So where do you think, let's just talk mainstream, JC, see if you follow my logic here. Where would somebody go if they wanted to be, and I'm not talking precious metals here, okay? Let's forget precious metals. Let's say you, all you know is mainstream. You don't want to be in the stock market. You don't want to be in the bond market. And you're afraid of bail-ins. Bail Where would someone put their money typically to, to earn very, very, very modest rate of return, but feel like they're safe? Uh, maybe I'm not answering that or asking that question, right? But let's just, I'll answer it for you. Let's say it's a money market, right? Money market accounts are typically that you'll find in brokerages, you'll find in 401ks. Uh, and in banks, but um, a money market account people feel is very safe, right? Mm -hmm. The same time they did the bail-in legislations, the less talked about part was the gating. Now I was talking to, uh, um, uh, I don't wanna mention his name because he didn't give me permission to do this, but another commentator like yourself who told me that he and his wife a few years ago were in a money market account where they were guaranteed, now this is after the gating had been put into place, and they were guaranteed two days redemption. Uh, and there was uh, when, uh, actually, so this would have been, I don't know if it would have been before the legislation. It was right when, right when, um, uh, not Bear Stearns, but uh, Lehman Brothers failed. And so when he went to redeem his funds, they were told that you could not touch them, that they were frozen because on the back end, those funds were invested with Lehman Brothers. So the point of it is, is that, and it's because of things like that, that gating was put in. Gating means you can't leave. And if all hell breaks loose, you're stuck. And so here again, we're talking about counterparty risk and we're talking about, you know, is it worth it to leave your money in a banking system earning next to nothing when you have bail-in and gating legislations? Uh, when you talk about, you know, the rule of 70 seconds. I don't know if your listeners know what that means. The rule of 70 seconds is you take the interest rate that you are being paid or charged uh, and you divide it into 72. And it tells you how long before your principal doubles at 7% interest in 10.2 years it doubles. And this is one of the reasons you see credit cards starting at 18% in four years, the, the principal doubles if all you do is pay the minimum balance. So when you talk about getting paid 
half of 1% to be in a bank or a 1% if you're lucky in a money market? Is it worth the potential risk when you see Wells Fargo saying we're closing our line of credit? When you see all the big banks throwing as much money into the reverse repo market as they possibly can because they're afraid of lending it out into an economy that is full of crap. Yeah. In other words, we are led to believe everything is great, but but the actions of the biggest money in the world are saying opposite. And that's why sometimes when I talk about misdirection and I say, trust your gut, don't listen to what is being said. Look at what they're doing. The only challenge in that is finding out what they're doing, looking and see what they're doing takes a lot of effort. And it's, well, it's not the six o'clock news, that's for yes. sure. <laughs> no. No, no, no. no. So I, I look at what you're talking about here today. It's really, really ominous. Mm -hmm. And again, front running what's coming next. They're closing their line of credit because they think that there's going to be problems in the line of credit. They wouldn't close it otherwise, right? So, I mean, that's the way you need to look at things. And, right. and that means that there's going to be maybe ultimately you do see rising interest rates. I don't know what the problem or what they're actually seeing, but I do know that it's not it's not something you would expect to see when everything is rosy. Whatever they're seeing, it's freaking them out. Of course, the operating word for July was panic. It was picked up in the uh, predictive linguistics. Uh, Cliff talked about this two months ago, and here we are. We're seeing it. And what you were just saying now here, you and I talked about this, I think, two or three episodes ago. Uh, this was Credit Suisse, uh, Credit Suisse um, suspending redemptions. And so we're seeing that happening now across the boards, too. And it's only going to accelerate here. And you and I had talked about the fact that uh, going back to precious metals here on that topic, the important part or the um, the luxury of maybe holding this in your own possession is exactly that, removing all of this counterparty risk, disintermediating from all of these people between you and your um, your wealth. And so this is, <laughs> this is the question uh, for today. And I think the audience is kind of like, well, okay, how fast do we have to move? And the question is, well, uh, if you don't have your insurance yet, you might want to buy it before the house is actually burned down. We're seeing the fires now. This, What we're seeing now, Wells Fargo, uh, these uh, suspensions of uh, redemptions, uh, we're seeing the fire right now. So guys, well, let, me, let me just explain one thing too so people fully understand reverse repo versus repo. In a repo market, uh, the banks have, have um, uh, treasuries and they're trying to sell them, back, give them back to the treasury so they can get more cash. Right. Uh, this is where you, you're you looking to get more money and you, overnight you lend the, the treasuries back to uh, to another, per, whether it be the Fed or to another bank, and, and then you get you get cash and you, you agree to buy them back. This is the opposite. This is where you have too much cash and you don't want to lend it out into the system or you can't lend it out into the system, so you give it back to the Fed. When you see the banks wanting to cease lending, which is their primary source of revenue, uh, and close the programs altogether. If that's not om ominous, om ominous, I don't know what is. And uh, this is why you have to, you know, kind of read between the lines. They're not telling you why they're doing it, but um, it, it's a problem. And I think it portrays the scary times ahead. Let's speak to the why. Cliff High has a good question here. It's in the chat. Let me bring it up. He says, ask Andy. Could the reverse repo be a way of going cashless, AKA digital only? Is this a stepping stone to maybe them introducing this new uh, financial system we've been hearing about? Uh, I don't know really because it's an overnight lending mechanism. I don't know if it is, but I do believe to Cliff's point that we are going cashless. And I mean, I, I've been saying that since last March when, when the genie was let out of the bottle when um, Nancy Pelosi in, in her House Subcommittee Finance Bill said uh, coronavirus can live on currency, so we're gonna, we want to go to a digital currency. Mm -hmm. You know, you're seeing China implement it with the digital yuan. You're seeing it around the country. You had, or around the world. And Jerome Powell came out and admitted that they are now experimenting with uh, uh, with this technology, with distributed ledger technology. I don't know if that, if that leads us towards a cashless society uh, or not, to be honest with you. That's a good question. That's a, a pretty deep one that I'd have to think about. But because it's overnight, I don't know how, how that would really bring us closer to a cashless society. But I do think we are heading in that direction. Uh, and the reason I think we're heading in that direction is is exactly 
maybe maybe I understand what he's saying now that I think about it. So yes, it's exactly these types of actions in the respect that, so yes, yes, Cliff, it is, yes, because what he's saying is basically the banks don't want to lend. What he's basically getting at is that because the banks don't want to lend, money is created in the United States, period, through lending. And if it's not lent into existence, it ceases to exist, in essence. It, it, when, when the Fed comes in and buys the bonds from the banks, the banks have two choices. They can either lend, well, they get the proceeds. They give the bonds to the Fed. They get the money. That money, they can either lend it out into the public, which now creates money in, in the, out in the economy, or they give it back to the Fed, where it, it's actually deflationary. Money's taken out of the system. The bottom line is what Cliff is simply saying here is that if the banks don't want to lend uh, and they're closing their lending products, well, that's going to make the Fed not real happy because now you don't get your inflation and your velocity. So the Fed now issues a digital currency and they can enact modern monetary theory and basic universal income right to your iPhone. They will spend it into existence yeah. rather than lend it into existence. So when I think about it, that, that's why he's as smart as he is. Things pop into his head a little bit quicker than they do mine. But yes, exactly what he is saying is true. Uh, if the banks don't want to lend, it's one step closer to a cashless society because otherwise everything freezes up and mm -hmm. you have no money creation. So uh, yeah, I think it is absolutely a, a probably a big step uh, closer to a digital cashless society where we don't have to rely upon the commercial banks lending money into existence. Rather, the Fed can enact their own monetary policy themselves, sidestepping the the, the banks and the current policy of, of money creation through lending. Do you remember also a couple of months ago, um, it could have been March or April now, but uh, China was uh, testing this new digital currency with an expiry date. So you just mentioned here velocity of money and trying to create inflation. Imagine that if they were paying you now in a digital currency that you have to spend in so much time, otherwise it disappears. Uh, let's talk about that. What are your thoughts? I think for most people, that wouldn't be a problem at all, you know, and uh and I think they could also tell you what you can and can't spend it on. I mean, a, a digital right. currency can be programmed any way that you'd like. See that the whole you're living week to week or paycheck to paycheck. Right. Yeah. Not a yeah, no, yeah. Or if you get a big uh, a big bonus from the Fed on uh, December fifteenth, and they say you have ten days to spend it or it's gone. Well, everyone gets a new Christmas present. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a great it's a great idea actually if that's what you're trying if you're trying to speed up velocity uh, because it, it sure would. And, um, and that's the problem here is that the, the current system, uh, you know, normally when the Fed buys bonds through quantitative easing, they're creating money to do that out of the ether, push a button and boom, we buy it. Normally that's very inflationary mm -hmm. because the banks would then lend money because this is how the banks make money by lending it out at, at a higher rate than they're getting it from the Fed for. So, the fact that they're reeling in their, their loans, closing their lines of credit, uh, and you see a massive rush into repo, reverse repo instead of lending it, that's exactly what Cliff's talking about, is that you? this is the antithesis of what the Fed wants. The Fed wants the opposite of that. The Fed wants inflation and velocity to make paying this growing mountain of debt easier to pay off, and that's why they keep interest rates low, right. to make it easier to pay off, but the low interest rates only incite and incentivize more debt. It's a it's a reinforcing loop that's getting us deeper in the hole. So to Cliff's point, yeah, I think we are heading to that to that place. And to your point, to put a, a timestamp on it would work. And I quite frankly, you know, we've often talked about the Belt Road Initiative in China. They're using their new digital yuan. They're incentivizing all of the contracts to be settled in digital yuan uh, specifically to, I think, that's where they want to go. You're seeing the world move into this, in this direction. And I think it's naive to think we won't be there. It may not be completely cashless all at once. It might be a parallel system like they're doing in China right now. But ultimately, I think that's the way we go. And, and the, the process of lending money into existence through the, the commercial banks, I think, will go the way, by the way of the dodo bird. It will disappear where the Fed will do all they can, and at least until we have a complete and total reset back by gold. Um, the Fed will do all they can to stimulate um, a velocity and, and, and create inflation to, to, to make paying off this debt a whole lot easier. Otherwise, it's default. It's either default or 
or monetize and uh, and inflate. Similar to how all of this education has led people maybe en masse here in the last couple of months to get their hands on physical silver, move away from all of the uh, synthetic products. You know, if you look at the work of uh, John Adams and, and, and you and Chris Marcus and all of these guys who are looking at all of the shenanigans that are happening at the institutional level where uh, people are selling the allocated accounts to the front corner here, the front counter here for uh, new customers in the hopes that they can come back and, and refill the allocated accounts before people notice. Now we're seeing these huge um, uh, withdrawals from the COMEX here and we've had the US Mint announce that of course there is this worldwide silver shortage now. It seems to be working. As humans get together and understand, it seems that we are changing their plans to some extent. We haven't seen that crash yet or that aha moment of the COMEX admitting default, although some would argue they've already defaulted. We just haven't heard about it yet. Is it possible also that if we get together, uh, Catherine Austin Fitz was talking about maybe using only cash on Fridays uh, to force the Fed into printing more paper here and to maybe skew their plans here to get into this digital currency. What are your thoughts on that? Is there a way maybe, does that even make sense at this point that we would try that? I don't, I don't know. I don't know at this point. I think uh, we the people have very little influence on the big plan, um, maybe less than we think. Um, anyways, um, but as far as what you're talking about, about what's happening on COMEX, um, look, with, it's interesting how they work it. I don't know how the hell they do it, but with three days left at the end of the June report or the June contract, there was about 220 million ounces left standing for delivery or rather in open interest, in open interest, which could stand for delivery. That means you had 220 million ounces in June contracts that could stand for delivery with three days left. And here's the crazy thing, JC, there was only 110 million ounces of registered silver behind that. So twice as much silver in theory could have been delivered or stood for delivery than there were bars registered to be delivered. As it got to the last day to July 1st or June 30th, that number is like 37 million. So they whittled it down somehow. And a lot of people think that they, um, they pay a, um, a premium. They'll pay a premium to the open contracts to not stand for delivery. Right. Either roll them forward or pay them a premium to make it financially, to financially incentivize them to take a cash settlement rather than a, um, a, a metal delivery. But even still, we're close, we've got to be close to 200 million ounces delivered so far this year. Uh, last year was 330, 340, it was a record year. Um, and it goes hand in hand with what I was talking about with the central banks repatriating their metal since 2017 and accumulating it. Front running, the biggest money in the world, whether yeah. it be central banks, commercial banks, sovereign wealth funds, and family offices. And the latter, those last two are the ones draining COMEX, family offices and, and sovereign wealth funds. But they're taking massive, massive, massive amounts of silver and gold off of the exchange. They're front running it. They're afraid. And here again, much like a fragile banking system, when you see the three days left in a contract where there's twice as much silver that could stand for delivery as there is registered silver to be delivered, it's a problem. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if, if the actions of a small group of people trying to uh, push the uh, hand of, of the Fed or of the powers that be would be as influential as as much as it would be if everyone bought an ounce of silver, uh, you'd blow things up quick. There's an interesting article uh, that Steve St. Angelo, a chart, I've talked about this a lot lately, Steve St. Angelo from um, SRS Rocco. SRS Rocco. He published a report uh, showing that the uh, for the past 20 years, roughly 80% of all the silver, that's his website, roughly 20% of uh, 80% of all the silver mined went to industrial uses. Only 20% went to investment. But from, but from 2020 on, it's flip-flopped. And you have a massive awakening globally 
to what silver really is offering and the value that you find in it. And in fact, that the investment demand is far greater than the uh, uh, industrial demand, which is really very hard to believe, but indeed that's what he is saying and, and by a large magnitude. So you put it all together, you know, you have silver with expanding industrial uses in green and digital applications and now a, an awakening. Uh, the Wall Street Silver Group, you, Chris, Bix, everyone's talking about silver and people globally are waking up to it. Yeah. And when you put that against the massive deliveries coming off of COMEX, things are getting, you know, there's a curse in China that says, may you live in interesting times. And things are getting real interesting uh, with the banking sector, with the COMEX, with uh, Basel III, with just everything, censorship. There's so many things happening right now. It's hard to know where to where to turn next, but that's why I think you have to turn off the noise and just look at what the big money is doing. And, and, and in terms of what you mentioned here, there's huge deliveries and it's not just on COMEX. We're seeing lots of silver backdoored out of SLV and gold out of GLV by the authorized participants, millions and millions of ounces that they are unable to take out. They fill it with paper obligations. Some people think, uh, or maybe the real thing, who knows, but drive down the paper price and then pull out the real thing at subsidized prices. You're seeing uh, uh, exchange for, for delivery um, uh, or whatever, exchange for physical, it's called EFP off the London Metals Exchange. The biggest money in the world is front running what's coming next. And when you see the banks doing what they're doing now by closing down their credit lines, these are what I, these are the types of actions I mean by trust your gut. Look at what the biggest money in the world is doing. And it's, and it's all very similar. Front running, de-dollarizing and removing counterparty risk. You know, what's funny. So on one hand, the bank accounts, the banks are reducing your, I guess your credit lines, your ability to play ball here. And on the other hand, if you're trying to get a physical silver off of the COMEX, you get the a Spanish phrase, plato o plomo. So you want lead, meaning you want lead or you want the silver. So most people put the dollars here to get out of it. Uh, so that's really interesting. Let me uh, bring up this slide here uh, to talk about some of our silver specials uh, for the Beyond Mystic audience here this week. Before I do that, I want to thank Rhonda. Thank you so much for that uh, PayPal tip jar. She says, thank you so much. And I think Judy was the next one. And Marcel, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate that. Uh, you guys make it possible for me to <laughs> be out here to do all of this stuff. I really appreciate it. Okay, Andy, let's talk about this cool new 10-ounce uh, PAMP silver here uh, on sale for the Beyond Mystic audience. This is the first time we've brought this one here. Um, what's special here? So, you know, the fact that it, it doesn't look like a super special price, but indeed I looked around and I don't know if, the Pam Swiss 10 ounce bars might be the nicest 10 ounce bars I've ever seen. And they do come packaged with assay certificates in those boxes at 550 over. It's the best price in the country. Uh, I do have for your listeners also uh, for $3 and 49 cents over. And I didn't send you this because it's just something that came up this morning. I have kilo bars from the wall street mint at 349 over. So whether it be the kilo bars at 349, these PAMP bars, which are the nicest 10-ounce bars I have ever seen at 550 over, um, or anything that your listeners are, or are looking for, I will make damn sure that we give them the very best price and, uh, and, and personal service. I promise you that. And, um, and what's so, the uh, turnaround time right now? I know you guys had a huge influx a couple of months ago. Has things stabilized now? And what can people expect if they fill out this form here to get this uh, best over spot uh, price from you guys? What's the turnaround like, both for uh, United States, but also for our Canadian uh, subscribers here? Uh, it's all in stock right now. And um, um, there is no turnaround time. turnaround time. It's in stock, ready to ship. OK, very good. Very good. Yeah, uh, I mean, we're, we're at that last uh, hurrah moment, I think. Um, if you look at some of the tarot card readers, the psychics, uh, the predictive linguistics, everybody was pointing to this massive tower card moment. So a big shakeup coming up. And of course, the word panic here for July seems to be in full swing now. Uh, when we talk about um, 
maybe the fear of missing out. So whether that's obtaining silver, physical silver in your hands, or maybe some cryptocurrencies as this hyperinflation hits, we're looking at potentially this information coming out now uh, on July 13th. And that ties into some of the timeline uh, that Cliff High was talking about here, that, that by the end of July, uh, things would go absolutely wonky. So guys, um, again, if you're trying to get your insurance policy in order, uh, maybe now's the time to um, reach out to Andy here. You can do so at beyondmystic.net forward slash silver. It is one of our affiliate programs. Uh, it enables us also to make a little bit at no extra cost uh, to you to keep us um, helping us <laughs> promote and publish all of this material because it's getting harder and harder <laughs> by the day here. And I'm laughing, of course, but it is a bit frustrating. Uh, this last two weeks, Andy, is just one thing after another. I'm having trouble getting my schedule back on track because I'm spending most of my time rebuilding what was just taken away. So, and then it's just disgusting. Yeah. Uh, and, and Kua says, what was the kilo offer? 349 over uh, any quantity. Um, I, look, I, I, if you want to, uh, Andy, after the show, send me the slide for that and I'll add it back uh, to the website so people can uh, choose that as well. We can do I that. will. And I would also like to say one thing. Um, it, it's really important, I think, to look at your precious metals not as an investment. You're not trying to get wealthy from them. And when you buy them or, or when, when you buy them or you want to buy more and the price goes down, don't be depressed. I mean, you're, n you're never bummed out when you go into a store and you see things on sale. Um, I think you have to realize that you can see what's happening and the big money is going to do all they can. If they're blurring what they're doing, they're going to kill the canary in the gold mine. That's gold and silver until they can't kill it anymore. The only way you can successfully manipulate a market is to push it in the direction it's going. And they cannot, they cannot ultimately hold back what's happening. And you can see the biggest money is preparing. So let's look at gold and silver, not as an investment, but as wealth. It will perform like an investment. But it's been wealth for 6,000 years. And in this this environment where things are getting really nuts really fast on so many levels, when you see Wells Fargo close their line of credit, and that's something you never would see, uh, buckle up, everybody, and buy gold and silver not to get rich. Buy it and hope you never need to use it. And if you do, you're damn glad you have it. And if not, and that's not just for an emergency. It could be an opportunity, too, when all this stuff shakes out and you're buying single digit price to earnings ratios and five or six percent uh, dividends on on blue chip stocks or you know maybe it's that 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 home that you want on the lake in ontario or or in the north woods of minnesota or here in florida at pennies on the dollar i don't know all i'm simply saying is that this is not about getting wealthy right now this is about protecting and uh and that's what gold and silver will do for you yeah. uh, and then like Walt is saying there, yes, just trying to preserve gain is a bonus. That's true. And you will gain. But people who buy gold and silver in, in, an, in an attempt to get wealthy should really be careful what they wish for. Because a price of gold and silver going to the moon doesn't portray well for the people around you that you love. They're all going to get screwed. Because very few people own any precious metals. And, and the people that are listening to this and understanding that, you're the pimple on the ass of the elephant. Uh, the elephant is the big, big group of people who will be sucked into bank accounts and money markets and traditional forms of investment. And when it all blows up, like Cliff's word of the month being panic, yeah. you'll understand exactly what that means uh, and why you own precious metals. And it was never to get wealthy. It was to preserve what you've worked your butt off for your whole life to, to obtain. Yeah, absolutely. And folks, if you want to go check out Cliff's work, a few people were asking, hey, why are you not on YouTube? He's having some issues. <laughs> Imagine that uh, with some of his content. So you can find him at BitChute here to go check out those last uh, videos. Uh, the Electric Woo was absolutely amazing also. Um, yeah, and in terms of what Andy was just saying now too, you might not like it uh, to make a profit on uh, silver or gold. Uh, it reminds me of some of the old forecasts from the Altib reports and maybe the Bare Naked Wealth uh, reports also from Cliff High, who um, 
we're predicting the $64,000 Bitcoin and in that same year, a $600 silver. We've hit the 64 this year in Bitcoin is the $600 silver coming. Uh, but in that report, it also warned that you may not like the world <laughs> $600 silver. So as Andy is saying here, be careful what you wish for. And I think uh, Walt had it right here. It's all about preserving your wealth. If you go at it from that position, uh, you're miles ahead of uh, the competition. Here. I remember so, I was working out and I saw that report, that YouTube, where he said 64,000. And I'm sorry, Cliff, don't be mad at me. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, no way. The dude hit it. He hit it, nailed it right on the, I'll never, I will, ne Cliff, I will never uh, discount anything that you ever say ever again. And I'm sorry publicly for, even in the recesses of my mind, like, no way. Hey, you know what? Uh, a track record like that, you need to listen to what he's having to say. And Six hundred dollars silver. Part of me in the back of my mind is saying, "No way." No way. <laughs> yes. But hey, you know, a lot of stranger things have happened. Evidently, uh, last year was all about strange, and it seems like we're still kind of in that paradox. But but for what it's worth, that's why I've been buying gold and silver every two weeks for thirty-one years. I promised to my father when I started this company with him that that was the only rule that I would accumulate. Yeah. Um, and I have honored my word for 31 years. I have never, ever, ever missed a two-week period. By the way, here is, um, real quick, this is a bigger version. This is the Kilo. That's the Kilo Pamp Swiss bar. Yeah. And this is the certificate that comes with it that matches. It's the exact same design as the 10-ounce bar. So this is what it looks like. It comes with the certificate that has the number that matches the number right there. So they're really cool. They're really neat. This is part of my bi-weekly purchase that I never miss. And of course, for your listeners, I just got caught up and sent out all the dragon bars. There are some dragon bars for whoever's gonna win some this week. And it's my pleasure to continue to send them out to your listeners. Awesome. Thank you so much. So folks, if you are looking at maybe getting your hands on this private collection, they're no longer available for sale, uh, but Andy is still giving them away here from his private collection. The silver, oh, wait a minute, let me just bring that up here. I have one here that was sent to me by William Lester, one of our uh, subscribers. So thank you so much. Um, I will be picking names from the PayPal tip jar from today, and we will announce that again uh, moving forward next week. And for those of you who sent me finally all of your mailing addresses, I sent that all to Andy and Andy has just shipped them as well. So please um, bear with us as we go through the mailing process and the shipping here delays that we're seeing across the board. So at some point, <laughs> you guys I will just... say one other thing. I was sent an express mail package uh, with tracking numbers from Minnesota um, June 22nd. I was supposed to have it June 26th. I haven't gotten it yet. Hmm. And uh, this was um, trackable, insured, Still don't have it from a friend of mine. Uh, something's really goofy with the mail right now. So uh, I did send them all. I have two left to send right here uh, to Mark and to Shauna. If you're listening, you guys are in Canada. One is that Mark Pacheco by any one. chance? Uh, yeah, it is. Okay, yeah. He was emailing me yesterday. He says, where's my coin? I say, I say, I think we're just uh, mailing it now. Uh, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of it. Don't, don't show it. Don't show the address. There's, it, there's the name. Okay. <laughs> There's the name if you can see it. Okay. Oh, yes, and Sean. So Mark, your coin is coming. And also Jordan. So these three are to Canada. And okay. when I went to the post office to personally send them, they told me, no, you need to fill out this customs declaration. So that's part of my weekend chores. Oh. You guys, I promise you will go out this weekend. All right. Thank you so much, Andy, for your time. And of course, folks, you can find uh, uh, Andy at milesfranklin.com. You can email him directly there from the site, or you can call the win 100 number. Oops, sorry, let me bring that back on the screen. And of course, this was the weekend, weekend review. Man, I'm having trouble speaking today, Andy. I think it's all of these disruptions. I'm, my mind is all over the place trying to rejig and, and bounce back from all of these uh, <laughs> curveballs. Yeah, that's that's right, that's all good. You're doing an amazing job. You're doing God's work. and we, I'm like I said, I'm just thrilled to be associated with what you are doing and and the awesome people that that uh, that listen to you that have been wonderful to work with. So uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. And 
Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots more interesting things to talk about. And uh, again, I just wish everyone a great rest of your day and a happy uh, weekend. It's on the horizon. And anyone needs anything from me, please feel free to send an email. I'll be, be more than happy to reply. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andy. And folks, please do remember to like this video, <laughs> try to boost up those numbers here so I don't get in more trouble. And also subscribe if you haven't already. We're rebuilding our community here. This is Jean-Claude at Beyond Mystics 3, our third edition, and maybe three times the charms. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you soon. Au Bye, everybody. Thanks, JC. Thanks, Andy. We seem to be stuck. I'm trying to close the yeah. TV. <laughs> I'm not sure if there. I'm not sure if we're still live. So hold on a second. Okay. It's just. Uh, yeah, we're stuck on end broadcast. Okay, there you go. Wait, end broadcast. Yes, end broadcast.